of the momentous events of Coronation Day, 2nd of June, 1953. Forty years ago, today, a young woman with touching sincerity made a promise before God to serve this nation and the worldwide commonwealth of which it is a part for the remainder of her life. She was just 27. She'd come here to Westminster Abbey, where William of Normandy came in 1066 to claim the throne of England. She sat in a chair in which almost all the sovereigns of England have been crowned since the reign of Edward I 700 years ago. Within it is set the stone of destiny on which the kings of Scots had been crowned since time immemorial. The Second World War had been over for less than eight years. The cities of Europe, London among them, were tired, battle-scarred, and shabby. Scenes of pageantry such as London witnessed that day had not been seen for 16 years, when her parents, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, had ridden to their unexpected crowning two years before the war began. Now, for the first time, it was not just the privileged spectators in the galleries around the theater, created in the crossing before the high altar, especially for the occasion, who saw the solemn ceremony. But millions all over the country watching on television. And by a miracle of BBC engineers' ingenuity, long before Eurovision links and satellite dishes, people in France, the Netherlands, and West Germany were able to see the pictures too. Telerecordings were flown in relays by Canberra bombers of the RAF across the Atlantic to Canada and the United States, where 85 million people stopped work to see the crowning of a British monarch. Some of us have special memories of that day. The early morning announcement that Everest had been conquered for the first time by Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tensing. Queen Salotti of Tonga, riding in an open carriage after the ceremony, waving to the crowds with a handkerchief, which she also used to mop the driving rain from her beaming face. The elder statesman, Sir Winston Churchill, created a Knight of the Garter just six weeks before by his young sovereign, so obviously moved by the splendor of an ancient ritual. Prince Charles, aged four and a half, and Princess Anne, just two, watching from an upstairs window as their mother came home to Buckingham Palace in the gold state coach, escorted on her royal progress by over 12,000 troops and Commonwealth representatives. Eight BBC commentators described the scene for viewers. One of them, from that day, became a household name, Richard Dimbleby. From the live television broadcasts, the BBC recorded seven hours of film, from which we bring you now, 40 years on, the highlight. Good morning, but not quite the morning we'd hoped for. There's a threat of rain from a dull, overcast sky. And against that sky, the Royal Standard flutters from the top of Buckingham Palace. And below, the east front of the palace on which all eyes are turned. For it's through that central arch that Her Majesty will first appear in about 10 minutes' time, riding in the gold coach of state. Looking down on the RAF guard, we can see beyond the beginning of the crowd. Now, there's not all that much standing room in this wide, open space that surrounds the Victoria Memorial, but every inch of pavement and the grass verge of the park beyond is jam-packed, not only with the people of London, but with the people who come from all over the world to see their queen ride to her coronation. And down there in the roadway, the only mounted band in the whole of today's procession. They're the greys of the trumpeters in their gorgeous mounted state dress, their velvet jockey caps, their gold laced frock coats. And they're the blacks on which the whole of the rest of the household cavalry are mounted.
that they had there, you could just see his head, that great warrior Pompey, the drum horn. And beyond the blues, the immaculate line of scarlet and black, the brigade of guards who line the route from here up to the Admiralty. And there, right in the neck of the mall, they're right in the neck of the mall, at the head of his 12 watermen is the Queen's barge master, Mr. Barry. Forward of them, the Queen's bodyguard of the Yeoman of the Guard, once the Sovereign's personal servants, and dressed still very much as they were 500 years ago. And here comes the Sovereign's escort of the Household Cavalry. And behind, riding in the gold coach of state, her husband at her side, comes Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. By the grace of God, Queen of this realm and of her other realms and territories, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. And so the Queen has started on her way down the Mall, past Trafalgar Square, to move along the Thames Embankment to Westminster. But we now go on ahead of the procession to Westminster Abbey and Michael Henderson. Westminster, the hub of today's great proceedings. The twin towers of the Abbey standing as they do on a site which has seen very nearly all our kings and queens crowned for almost 900 years, these towers, with a feeling of timeless calm, look down on the excited crowds below, many of them probably seeing their first coronation. And between the pack stands here, down this route which Her Majesty the Queen will shortly be coming, We've just arrived in time to see the beginning of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's procession. Arriving at the door of the annex to the Abbey. First of all, the captain's escort of the household cavalry. And now the Irish state coach bearing Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother with Princess Margaret. This then is the annex in which the Queen will wait and in which Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who we've just seen arrive with Princess Margaret, is now waiting to pass with her procession through the west door behind. So we too will go inside where Richard Dimbleby looks down the full length of the Abbey. Here in the Abbey Church of St. Peter, Westminster, a great congregation of 7,000 come from every part of the world awaits the arrival of Her Majesty. Dominating the whole of this coronation theatre 
there stands on the small dais that you see the throne. The throne into which Her Majesty will be lifted after she has been crowned. And if you look closer at this lovely chair, you see that worked in gold and blue upon it in thread, it bears the royal device set against the background of deep crimson brocade. And below the throne, raised by most ancient tradition upon a dais or a mound, there stands nearer to us as we look now from the extreme east of the abbey, from above and behind the high altar, there stands one of the treasured relics of the realm, King Edward's chair. The old, worn chair in which, for centuries, kings have been crowned. And you will see, under its seat, lying in its appointed place, the red stone of school. And meanwhile, outside, away from the abbey, down on the Thames Embankment, all the school children in their thousands are waiting for the coming of the Queen. And with them is Max Robertson. And here you see more than 30,000 school children cheering their heads off, having the time of their lives on this coronation day as they see all the Queen's horses and men going by. Lord Cheddar there on the right in the first carriage. Second in command to General Eisenhower for the invasion of Europe. Field Marshal Lord Wilson and Viscount Trenchard in the third carriage. And at last the coach to which all eyes have been waiting and all cheers as they give forth full throated. Mountbatten, the Duke of Gloucester in picture now. And such a burst of loving cheering from these children as will not be heard in the whole of London today. And so they've seen the Queen on her coronation day, a memory that's going to live surely with those children for their lives. And with their cheers to gladden her heart, Her Majesty goes to dedicate herself to her people, queen and mother of the greatest family of nations on earth. And here at Westminster, this procession of the queen's protectors is nearing the end of this part of its journey. The bells of St. Margaret's are pealing a great welcome, and the thousands of men and women and children packing the vast stands and the pavements are welded together in one great surge of emotion and excitement and we know, know too that in just a few moments will become round that corner the military naval and air force officers of high rank who precede our queen on the right of the picture General Templer to remind us of those men who, 
at this moment are guarding the Queen's realm 10,000 miles away in Malaya. And in the center, General Kirar from the oldest dominion of Canada. And behind them, the Queen's escort of officers from our Commonwealth, Bataans from the northwest frontier of Pakistan, New Zealanders, officers of the Australian Light Horse, Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. But it's the sight of the scarlet and gold of the sovereign's bodyguard that stirs us now with the realization that very soon, very soon, the Queen will come. And now, here comes Her Majesty. into the annex. She will wait there a while, but we will go on ahead of Her Majesty into the Abbey. We will go within to the splendid scene which there awaits her. Now indeed, the atmosphere and the whole feeling in this historic building is tense. There is a hush. The music stops and pauses. And we wait for the procession, the grand procession, which will bring Her Majesty to us. A blaze of heralds. The trumpet sounds. Admiral of the Fleet, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, attended by the gentlemen at arms. Duke moves to his chair. Behind him, Midshipman Rees is paid. And as the choir begin their lovely anthem, I was glad, there come into sight all the splendors of the great officers and the regalia. Behind the heralds, the scepter with the cross carried by Marshal of the Royal Air Force, the Viscount Portal of Hunter, St. Edward's staff, borne by the Earl of Lancaster. Then to the left, 
Lord Hastings with a golden spur, to the right, Lord Churston with the other. And behind, the three swords. On the left, the second sword borne by the Earl of Hume. In the center, Katana, the short and blunted sword of mercy borne by the Duke of Northumberland. And the third sword to the right, borne by the Duke of Maclough and Queensbury. There follow Clarence Sir, Nora and Ulster, King of Arms. And then together, left to the right, the gentleman usher of the Black Rod, in the center, Garter Principal King of Arms, on the right, the Lord Mayor of London. There is the Lord Great Chamberlain, the Marquis of Chamberlain. And behind him, the High Constables of Scotland and the Lord High Steward of Ireland. And then the Great Steward of Scotland, the Earl of Crawford and Balcan. And now, to the left, the Lord High Constable of England, Viscount Allenbrook. In the centre, the Marquis of Salisbury bears the sword of state. To the right, the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk. Attended all by their pages. And then followed by St. Edward's crown, borne by the Lord High Steward, Admiral of the Fleet, the Viscount Cunningham of Hindley. On his right, the orb is borne by Earl Alexander of Tunis. On his left, the rod with the dove borne by the Duke of Richmond and Gordon. Then the pattern, the Bible and the chants. And as the music rises in triumph, we await Her Majesty the Queen. her sister and the other members of the royal family watched her pass. Her Majesty now moves in her procession down the length of this abbey, moves in her beautiful shimmering gown with its long purple train, the train of purple velvet lined with gold, edged with ermine, embroidered all over with gold. And she wears, as we see her now, the imperial state crown. In her hands, the scepter and the rod. The sign that in her hands, justice and mercy are never to be separated. Her supporting bishops walk with her as their predecessors have done through the centuries. The maids of honor bear her train. The mistress of the robes walks behind, never for one moment taking her eyes from the train. On each side, the long white plumes of the gentlemen of arms escort her majesty as she moves now through the organ screen and into the nave. We too now go to the west door of the abbey so that we may see Her Majesty approach. Preceded by the three swords, by the officers of state.
so to that stirring music, majesty, splendor, and beauty pass from our sight as the queen goes in her lovely robe out of the nave of the abbey. History has been written and sung here today in this warm and beautiful old building where it has been written and sung for many hundreds of years. But never before have so many seen the crowning of the sovereign or so many shared in her dedication in this abbey church, which in its changing forms has sheltered the crowning of our kings and queens for nigh on a thousand years. And into the first carriage, the first to step in is the Tenku Ampuan, the wife of the Sultan of Solanga. The Sultan is wearing the robes of yellow silk, which is a royal color amongst Malayans, and getting in on the other side in the black, all black robes, the Sultan of Lahej. Sultan of Zanzibar with the beard waving now. And the Sultan of Pera from the Federated Malay States facing us with the spectrum. A truly regal figure stepping into the carriage now on the left there, the Queen of Tonga. Queen Saloti, the only other queen in the Commonwealth apart from our own Queen Elizabeth. Tonga, or the Friendly Islands, about a thousand miles north of New Zealand. She's wearing over her traditional costume of dried leaves, the mantle of Dame Grand Cross of the British Empire. And opposite her, the Sultan of Kelantan, also from the Federated Malay States, wearing robes of white silk and a golden crease in his sash. Mrs. Gandhi and Mr. Nehru there, just passing through under the umbrellas. Mr. Nehru, Prime Minister of India. Sir Winston Churchill in his garter robes and hat. A terrific cheer from the crowd here as they get their first glimpse of him in his new finery. garter robes or no garter robes, there is still the famous Churchill smile and victory sign. And there, with the empty state coach, normally when it is filled with our Queen, we haven't really much eyes for the coach, only for Her Majesty. There we have a chance of seeing the coach itself. business to manage a long train. go ringing through Parliament Square and up Whitehall from the greatest crowds assembled all up the route. Wishing Her Majesty a long and prosperous reign, the Queen sets forth 
on her five mile drive back to Buckingham Palace to be greeted on every side by her subjects for the first time after her coronation. Ahead, up Whitehall, along Piccadilly and into Hyde Park lies the great procession which will have started to move as the state coach left us here at the Abbey. In Hyde Park, just by Grosvenor Gate, we wait for the head of the procession with Brian Johnson. And there you see the head of the procession as it moves towards Grosvenor Bay here in Hyde Park. Leading the procession is Colonel Burroughs, nicknamed Digger, on that bay horse. And behind the bands from the 32 colonies, we have, ranging from the Falklands in the west to Fiji in the east, 500 officers and men from the armed police forces and the three armed services. First, the police forces, mostly from Malaya. The pillboxes are from Malaya, those black pillbox hats. Then from the RAF, the Aden Protectorate there in the turbans, the khaki turbans from Aden. And among the military forces, we have representatives from Malta. Good to see them here and just behind the Malay Regiment with their colours. And behind them we have the men from Fiji, come 12,000 miles. And behind them, the Kortha carrying colours, the King's African Rifles and the Northwest African Frontier Force. Now come the Mounties. Head of the Mounties is marching the Insignia Party bearing the flag of Canada. Since Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, every Jubilee and coronation procession has included a contingent from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And now, to lead off for the Army, the Home Guard are just upon us. Yes, and wearing battle dress, their only uniform and led by a VC, Colonel Rupel of the 1418 War. There he is. Carrying Sten guns, you'll notice, they've cast their pikes away. again on the crowd but no umbrellas up allowed here just newspapers on the head the tops have been put up on these carriages except this one in which we have the Queen of Tonga here is the Queen of Tonga in the only open carriage so far in the procession Her Majesty the Queen of Tonga. And now as the great cheer goes up, it is of course for the Right Honourable Sir Winston Churchill and Lady Churchill, the United Kingdom. Sir Winston's escort is of the 4th Queen's own hussars, of which he is of course Colonel-in-Chief. Yes, there he is, there is Sir Winston. Now the Irish state coach, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret. Excitement intense here, hearts beating faster as the Queen approaches in the state coach.
so the coach goes down its way to Oxford Street and we go ahead now down to the Mall, where the head of the procession should be well down towards Buckingham Palace. So forward to Chester Wilmot to wait for the Queen's homecoming. Looking down now on the, from the river Buckingham Palace, we see the RAF contingent swinging around Victoria Memorial, solid phalanxes of blue moving in good old precision. Behind them, the Home Guard, followed by the University Training Corps. Coming up behind these volunteer pilots come the women of the Royal Air Force. Once the WAF, now an integral part of the RAF, wearing their new hats and very glamorous in their nylons. And in the last row, you'll see the members of the Princess Mary Royal Air Force Nursing Service, the girls who fly regularly with the Korean Evacuation Service. Here we come now with the senior regiment of the line, everyone more than 250 years old. Typical of them, the Suffolks in the second rank. Just come back from Malaya after splendid service there. At the end of the line, the Royal Scots, the right of the line, in the service of British sovereigns for 320 years. And in the Queen's service, the Royal Scots leave on Friday for Korea. This festive day is merely an interlude in the working and serving life of these regiments of the line. Charge looking down on this great ribbon of heraldic colour, terribly excited, pointing as he sees the coach approaching in which his mother rides. Prince Charles, Prince Anne, laughing, smiling, happy at this wonderful scene. Now, towering above the white plumes of the second division of the Sovereign's Escort, we can see rolling majestically forward the gold coach of state. On its roof, three cherubs, the spirits of England, Scotland and Ireland, supporting a royal crown, a model of the imperial state crown Her Majesty wears in the coach below.
so the gold coach of state passes through the central arch and her majesty the queen has come home and behind ride high officers of state and of the royal household the crowd are gathering round the palace in front of the gates but the police are keeping them back and they're waiting now patiently as they have all day waiting for the fly past as the planes come in there'll be 72 meteors and 24 sabers and they'll fly in wings with line astern they'll come in uh, over the river from the south past Westminster Abbey and the House of Parliament and they'll come across the Mall. they won't come up the Mall. they'll come across the Mall so that Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh Queen Mother and the other members of the royal family standing on the balcony will able, be able to see them sweep past over this processional way and on to the north the 96 aircraft will come as I say in line astern with 20 second gaps between wings the police have been remarkably successful in keeping the crowds back they asked the crowd to be forbearing and not to try and surge forward so that disabled veterans could get away. And now here is the Queen. Charles and Princess Anne waving there just as their mother did 16 years ago at her father's coronation. And now the crowd have broken through the cordon of police and guardsmen and they're surging across. state crown and looking as composed as she has throughout the day. Prince Charles getting a clearer view now than he did when he was looking through the window a little earlier as the state coach was approaching down the mound. And here now are the first of the planes. The first wing of meteor jet fighters coming over at 350 miles an hour at about a thousand feet. formation, a box formation of wings, but because of the weather conditions, they've had to fly with 20 second intervals between wings. How fitting it is that the RAF should pay the final tribute to Her Majesty today. How fitting it is because German bombs landed in the courtyard of this palace which King George VI and Queen Elizabeth refused to leave throughout the Blitz. The crowd now is absolutely dense around the gates and thousands are surging up the mall towards the palace which has now become the focus of everybody's interest and attention
Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth, goes in, followed by other members of the Royal House of Prince, Princess Margaret. And so, with this coronation day, begins a new chapter in the long pageant of British history. Our newly crowned queen has this day dedicated herself anew to the service of all of us, her subjects throughout the Commonwealth and Empire. We pray for her a long, glorious, and happy reign. God save the queen. <laughs>